Turn it on. Okay. Uh, I'm continue our series on the plagues of Egypt, and we're going to be studying the fifth plague tonight: uh, pestilence. And that will be in Exodus, the ninth chapter, the first seven verses. We're continuing our study here. In previous sermon uh, in the series, we looked at the fourth plague that God sent on Egypt, the plague of flies. And in that sermon, we saw that Pharaoh was warned by God of the coming plague, and yet he refused that warning. And we saw Pharaoh covered in, in that plague with flies, covered everything and everyone in Egypt, and spared the Israelites. And lastly, we saw Pharaoh, uh, again, defiant against God. Even though God was showing he had the, the true power, he was the one and true God, Pharaoh was stubborn and kept hardening his heart against God, against Moses. So as we look at the fifth plague, this plague is against the livestock of Egypt. And we're going to, to focus on the on the powerful hand of God. Now it's, it may sound slightly familiar because uh, the, the few weeks back there when we looked at the plague of lice, we focused on the, the finger of God because uh, what he can do with his finger. And the reason that message came about was because... Uh, that's what, when the magicians could not duplicate the plague of lice, then they credited God. They said, this is surely the, the finger of God. And Pharaoh obviously did not listen to them. And because of that, refused to let people go. And that fourth plague came upon them, uh, the plague of the flies. Now, in this fifth plague, Pharaoh is going to find out directly from God that these plagues truly are the work of the hand of God. I remember when Casey was born and I was, you know, even though I'd had two boys before, she seemed a little different, of course. And I remember how big my hand looked next to hers when I held her hand, her tiny little hands, and that they were so small that when she tried to you know, wrap her hand around my finger, it only covered part of it. And I thought, wow, you know, I'm her father and my hand is big enough and strong enough that I'm always going to be there to protect her. Well, maybe not always. And that's how God's hand, though, is. It's, it's bigger and more powerful than anything you and I can imagine. And... And we're going to see how he shows in this plague how he is the one true God. So as we start on our first one there, um, God's hand can send pestilence. And we look at the first three verses here. And then the Lord said to Moses, Go up, go up, um, go in unto Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go, that they may serve me. For if thou refuse to let them go, and wilt hold them still, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, upon, and upon the sheep, and there shall be a very grievous murrain. Uh, now we probably all, pretty much all recall the few years back when there was that uh, the swine flu scare, and then shortly after that there was the bird flu that, that came out and everyone was, was very worried and there were uh, worries about vaccinating, vaccination shortages and, and people were getting shots and they were worried about that. And it seems like every, just about every year since then, flu season breaks out and Flu shots are available, and, and there's uh, people a little freaked out always. I mean, uh, you go on the bus, on the train, or going to work there, and someone starts coughing a little too much, then uh, people start giving them some, some very 
nervous, ugly looks and start kind of moving away. And, and I understand that. I mean, the flu is, is nothing fun. There's nothing fun about it. It's uh, very miserable. And I think this plague on the, on the cattle and on the other livestock here awakened some of the terror there about infectious diseases. We notice in verse 1 that God again sends Moses in with this message to Pharaoh. And looking from the outside, uh, those that might criticize God for sending such harsh judgments on Egypt, I would say, you know, God kept warning Pharaoh time and time again, if you don't let my people go, if you only let, let the Hebrews children go, then I'm going to send this plague. So even when God's hand is powerful, it's, there, there was some mercy shown here, long-suffering and not willing that um, that this these problems would af, uh, afflict them. But it's interesting that God's message to Pharaoh this time, he says about the plague, he says specifically, Behold, the hand of the Lord will be upon your livestock. It's going to be on your cattle and, and so forth and so on. And uh, with this very severe pestilence. Now the King James Version uses a, a different word here. In the first plague, the water was turned to blood. Moses and Aaron used the rod there to uh, kind of start that off. In the second plague, he smites Egypt with frogs, and once again the rod is brought out. The third plague of lice, God doesn't even warn Pharaoh but uh, again uses the rod to send that plague. In the fourth one, he says, I'm going to send flies. And now in the fifth plague, he says specifically, the hand of God is going to be on your livestock. So even though God's sending each of these plagues, making it clear, I think he specifically says his hand is going to do this because Pharaoh has grown very stubborn against Moses and, and letting the people go. Pharaoh still thinks, I think he's still in control because he's still on the throne. He's not been dethroned. Uh, he still has the Israelites as slaves. Still thinks, he believes he still has them in his hands. He's in control of them. And he has what God wants and as long as he keeps that, he wins. But God's saying, no, you're not winning this. These are my people, and with my hand, I'm going to prove it to you again. So God sends this plague upon the livestock. In the King James Version, we said you know, the, the word pestilence is, is murrain. And it's like, what is that? Adam Clark gives this detailed description of the disease. He says, Moraine is a very contagious disease among cattle, the symptoms of which are hanging down of the head, abundance of gum in the eye, rattling in the throat, difficulty of breathing, uh, staggering hot breath, shiny tongue, uh, proof that uh, general inflammation has taken place. So this is... Uh, pretty gross and severe disease. And it spread through all the livestock in Egypt that were in the field, livestock that were extremely valuable to the Egyptians. And God almost completely wipes them out. The fascinating thing about this is once again he says, I'm judging the people of Egypt and, and, and Pharaoh in proving him powerless against my power. So all these animals would have been considered more or less sacred by the Egyptians. An animal was probably mo that was most sacred to them was probably the bull. So, but economically, spiritually, this plague was extremely devastating to the Egyptians. And God was showing his power at work. So what does this mean to Christians? You know, in the scripture, God's used diseases um, 
as part of his work several times. We'll give a few examples. In Numbers, the 12th chapter, verse 10, And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Numbers 10, Moses' brother and sister Aaron and Miriam opposed Moses, and in judgment, God sends this disease of leprosy on Miriam. And she and Aaron repent, and seven days later, she's healed. In Second Chronicles 26, verse 19, and Then Uzra was wroth, and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord, from beside the incense altar. So in Second Chronicles 26, king of Judah becomes filled with pride and attempts to offer incense to, the, to God in, in the temple, something that was for the priests to do. And the priests come, they try to stop him, and he starts yelling at him in anger. And while he's still yelling and raging... God sends this disease of leprosy on him to stop him. And in this case, the leprosy is never removed from him and he dies to the day of his death. Or you say, well, that's the Old Testament. Well, there's stuff in the New Testament too. In Acts, um, the 21st chapter, uh, sorry, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 21, then upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made or or nation upon them, and people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not glory God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. In the book of Acts, God struck Herod with a disease that caused his stomach to uh, be in excruciating pain for five days. He was eaten of worms. And God sent this disease because, as this verse, these verses say, Herod, uh, they called Herod that he was a god, and he accepted that worship instead of correcting them. And so he was uh, judged at that time. In Acts, the 13th chapter, verse 6, first, and, then, and when they had gone through the isle into Patmos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. And in the eleventh verse, And behold, the hand of the Lord was upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, and not see the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. So in the book of Acts, here this sorcerer Bar-Jesus opposed Paul's preaching so that God struck him blind with some sort of disease, eye disease, that Scripture said that lasted for a season. Now in 1 Corinthians, sometimes read this around the when we're observing the Lord's table, uh, this warning afterwards, it said that, and he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now when we're taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, they were not taking this seriously, and they were being greedy and were gluttonous, and they ate all the foods that uh, and didn't, you know, didn't worry about what they were doing, really. So the Apostle Paul was telling him for this reason that the believers were weak and sickly, and some had even died, uh, perhaps also a judgment by God on them for not observing this correctly. So what does God, what does God use disease to judge Christians? And say, in some cases that may be the case. In some cases, no, it wouldn't be. You and I can't be the judge of that because we're, we'd start saying, oh, you must have committed some pretty bad sin because you got shingles or uh, you got cancer or heart disease or a great many number of things. 
uh, now the point is that God's hand of God, he can use diseases in his judgment. If he chooses, he can also heal diseases if he chooses. It's controlled by him. I mean, we're told in James that we should pray for the sick, that the prayer of the of faith shall save the sick. Once again, it's God's choice on whether the diseases are healed or not. If he does not heal them, that doesn't make mean that they were bad necessarily. It doesn't mean that they didn't have enough faith. God is in control no matter what, and if a disease leads to our death even, it it's it may be hard for others to understand or cope with, but it doesn't mean that, uh, that their heart is not right and that, that doesn't keep us from getting sick. God's hand can also separate groups. Um, in verses 4 through 6, it says, And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall... Nothing die of all that is of the children of Israel. And the Lord appointed a time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did the thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died, but the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. In high school, I remember you know, trying out for uh, region band and public speaking and and other competitions, and it being in front of judges and who were comparing me to other kids my age, I don't rem ever remember feeling very nervous on those occasions, really. But the first time, time my kids were judged, it was a completely different experience. I was nervous as a cat at a dog show. One of the thoughts that you know would run through my head when you no know, and like the first time that Jeremy would be um, going up against a judge or something, was they have a lot of power. They have a lot of power in their decisions there. They choose who makes it on, who goes on, makes bands or whatever they're trying out for, sparing the separating the good players from the not-so-good players. But just like the directors that decide on which players progress to the next level, God in his hand, his powerful hand, he separates people the way he wants to as well. He can see and be the true judge. In the ninth chapter here in these verses, we see him separating the Egyptians from his people, the Israelites, in order to send this plague at the Egyptians and sparing his people, sparing the Hebrews. Uh, he even tells Pharaoh in verse 4, I'm going to make a difference between your livestock and theirs. Nothing will die that belongs to my people. So remember the plague of the flies. God told Pharaoh, I'm going to send, I'm going to set the people of Goshen apart, and none of the flies are going to be over there. And that's exactly what happened. So now, once again, he's telling Pharaoh, my people's livestock is not going to be affected by this plague. Pharaoh was stubborn, even though God protected his people from you know, the previous plague like he said he would. Pharaoh still wouldn't acknowledge that the Israelites were God's people, not his. So God, in effect, says, okay, I'm going to do it again. Watch this time as a very contagious disease wipes out all your livestock, but doesn't spread over to the Israelites, to the slaves, to my people. It's amazing because this same God who sent the, this pestilence is the same God who kept his, people lives, his people's livestock healthy and safe from the plague. The Egyptians might have said something like this, well, this God has power over the cattle. This God has power over the horses, this, over the camels, over health and disease. So they had to take a look at this plague and think, how could none of our gods stop this from happening? Some that looked like those things. Couldn't at least one of them stepped in 
and protected at least some of the livestock. But the Israelites could say, you know, our God is the true God and he has power over all creation. Everything from the livestock to disease, he has power to spread disease among the livestock, protect other livestock, even if they're standing right next to each other. So not only is God separating the Egyptians from the Israelites in this purpose of judgment, but he's also separating their livestock in those animals that they considered pretty sacred. A Bible commentator, uh, Alan Combe, cites an ancient record of battle that the Egyptians lost because their enemies put a herd of cattle in front of their advancing troops. And it worked because the Egyptian soldiers would not shoot at the opposing army for fear of accidentally killing one of those sacred cattle. So you see, the views of these animals were rather uh, ridiculous to the, the, the losing of um, life and freedom there for them. It show, God showed the Egyptians that they what they held sacred, their livestock in reality, were just animals. And, and animals that he created, and he had power to create them, he had the power to kill them. And so we see his hand at work when he tells Pharaoh tomorrow, I'm going to do this thing. He had a whole day to think about it, but still his heart was hardened. It didn't matter if God gave him a week or a month or whatever time he gave him. I think his mind was made up that he wasn't going to let God's people go. We see this pattern, and we see it continuing going through the next five plagues, almost uh, so that what does the idea of God's powerful being able to separate groups have to do with us? On that passage, you have two, um, two groups of individuals, the Egyptians and the Israelites. And the Egyptians worshipped false gods, and the Israelites worshipped God, the true God. The livestock of the Egyptians died, and the livestock of the Israelites survived. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, the words of Jesus here in verses 31, When the Son of Man shall come in glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from, his go from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand and on the goats, the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come, Ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In our world today, there are two groups of people. There are those who are not followers of Christ, and those there are those who are. Those who are not his followers worship other things, worship other ways, different ways than described in the Bible, a number of things. There are thousands of cults and other religious organizations in the world today, and all of them are pointing away from the kingdom of Christ. Those who are followers of him worship him alone and worship him the way that he's described and laid about God in his pattern that we have. One day, whether we're a follower of Christ or we're not, we're going to have to stand before him. I don't have a lot of time to give detailed lessons about the end of times, but I'm going to summarize the best I can. For Christians, we're going to have to stand before him. There's going to be a judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.10. and must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that we may receive uh, things done in, this, in his body according to what he hath done, whether they be good or bad. So described here, we will be rewarded for the work that we've done for the Lord. We'll lose rewards if we have not or chose not to. We'll be judged for what we've done and we'll have to stand before the great white throne. In Revelation 20.12, saw the dead, small and great, 
stand before God. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of the things which were written in those books according to their works. This judgment described in Revelations 20, believers will stand before God and judgment will be judged for their rejection of Christ. We're not told that anyone not found in the Lamb's book of life, we're told that those that are not found in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. Someday the powerful hand of God will again separate his followers from those who are not. Christians have a relationship with him and they and we enjoy that uh, that knowledge that we one day we will be with him. We will be welcomed into his king his uh, into this eternity. No death, no sorrow. Unbelievers, however, will face a judgment all completely different. Our final point, uh, his hand can prove his, his truth. We'll use verse 7. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of, of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Uh, back in high school again, I played on the tennis team, and one day we had a match in another small town. And my friends, one of my friends, thought this girl on the other from the other school was kind of cute, and so I said, "You know what? I bet I can get her phone number." Now my friends laughed because they didn't think I was brave enough or handsome enough, and to actually get her number. So eventually they said, "Okay, prove it. Go do it." And I got up, walked over to the girl before she left, and I told her, you know, my friends didn't think I was brave enough to get her phone number. I wanted to prove them wrong. She laughed and wrote down a phone number for me. And I went back to my friends, showed the number. They couldn't believe it. I was a, a hero for a few minutes, moments there. Funny thing was when I tried to call that number later, it was not a working number. So she got the last laugh. The reason I tell the story is because we don't, when we don't think someone will do something, the first thing that comes to our mind is, okay, you prove it. You go and prove it. And that's what Pharaoh does here. He doesn't want to believe that God has the power to protect Israel's livestock from this terrible uh, infectious disease. So he says, prove it. And he sends someone over there to check the livestock. And the verse you know, has to make you smile a little bit. This is the, the fifth plague that God has sent on Israel, has uh, sent on Egypt, and, and Pharaoh sends someone to check on whether or not God actually did what he said he was going to do. And once again, his stubbornness, he did not believe uh, the plague was coming. And when it did happen, did not believe that Israel's livestock was protected. I guess maybe he thought God didn't have the power to kill this one over here and save this one over here. Perhaps he thought he could turn it around and say, you killed your own livestock. All he knows is that this person came back and told Pharaoh, yes, it's exactly that. that they're all alive over there. Not one of their livestock is dead, but all ours are. Pharaoh learned once again that when God said he's going, this is going to happen, he made it happen exactly that way. So what about us then? Uh, sometimes we doubt God and want proof that uh, he's true. And I think we could all say, that yes, probably sometimes in our life we probably have kind of faced this doubt for ourselves and been thinking about, and when I think, when I think about that, I think about, about Thomas. You know, in uh, the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came, and the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, 
But he said unto them, Except I see his hands and the print and his the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now he's better known as doubting Thomas because of of this, of this incident. You know, not much is written about Thomas, but so he had this story where he gets labeled there, it's uh, doubting Thomas. The other disciples were there. He wasn't. When he came back later, they were all excited. They were sharing the good news. And he said, I, I don't believe it. Good old Thomas didn't believe. And yet when Jesus appeared and held out his hands and for Thomas to see and touch, Jesus proved to Thomas that he truly was the risen Messiah. He had risen from the dead and you and I today don't see Jesus face to face while on this earth. He's at the right hand of God, we believe, and one day He's going to return. Yet His power, the powerful hand of God still proves to us that He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He is real. His Word is true. He proves it constantly over and over again as He brings us through trials in our lives, through our temptations. In many ways, we don't perhaps realize or understand the healing of our sicknesses, the number of things that He can do. When we pray to Him, He proves it by listening to our prayers, answering according to His will. Then hopefully we believe as, as Thomas did. Jesus told him, Thomas, because thou hast seen Me, thou hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Hand of God is much more powerful than we can imagine. And it never grows weary, it doesn't grow small, it doesn't push us away. If we are a follower of Christ, that hand of God is upon us, on our side, and that's a good thing. But if you're here today and you don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, you have not. He is not your Savior. You've not obeyed Him in baptism, then the hand of God is something to fear. His hand will someday send you off to that lake of fire for all eternity.